Welcome to Maximum A Posteriori Estimation in Bayesian Learning. This is a video lesson for probability and statistics. Today we'll explore two alternative methods for parameter estimation that are intimately tied to Bayes' theorem, Maximum A Posteriori Estimation and Bayesian Learning. We'll introduce Maximum A Posteriori Estimation first. So given measurements, d equals x1, x2, x3, all the way up through xn of some random variable x that we believe is described by a distribution, f of m in x, we hope to estimate values for the unknown parameter m so that we can use our sampling distribution for computing probabilities. A third way of obtaining this estimate after method of moments and maximum likelihood estimation is called maximum a posteriori estimation, or MAP. It also involves the creation of the so-called likelihood function. P of d given m equals f of m and x1, x2, all the way up through xn. In addition, MAP calls for us to devise a so-called prior distribution for the unknown parameters, and this distribution is p of m. This is simply an uninformed or subjective statement of the relative likelihood of possible values that the parameter m might take on. Deciding upon a suitable prior distribution for the parameters is one of the more difficult parts of map estimation. Some choices lead to better estimates than others. We will not be taking a very nuanced look at the selection of prior distributions. In cases where m is a continuous parameter that ranges over a bounded interval, such as m is greater than or equal to 0 or less than or equal to 1, the beta distribution can be used as a prior. In cases where m is a continuous parameter that ranges over a partially bounded interval, such as m is greater than or equal to 0, we can use the gamma distribution as a prior. And if m is a continuous variable that ranges over the entire real line, we may just use the normal distribution as a prior. There are other valid choices, but these will suffice for the purposes of our initial look at map estimation. In fact, we're really only going to be working with map estimation in the context of this video lesson as something to motivate the technique that we're really going to be interested in using, which is Bayesian learning. So it's not going to be that critical that we dig so deep into the details of how MAP works. However, in just a little bit, we will at least introduce the beta and gamma distributions and what their individual properties are. Once the issue of choosing a prior distribution for M has been dealt with, a posterior distribution may be computed using Bayes' theorem. The posterior distribution is the probability of m given d, given our set of observations, and we compute it using this, the familiar Bayes formula, p of d given m times the prior p of m divided by the marginal probability p of d. So here p of d is the marginal probability and we compute it using the law of total probability and this is either going to be its integral form when m is continuous or its summation form when m is discrete. In either case, since our data points x1, x2, up through xn are all measured values and this integration or summation takes place over all possible values of m, p of d is a purely numerical quantity. Now MAP calls for us to seek the value m hat that maximizes the posterior distribution. Since p of d is constant, this is equivalent to maximizing the so-called posterior likelihood function, which is just g of m in x1, x2, up through xn, equal to the probability of d given m times the probability of m. If the parameter m is a continuous variable, then this becomes a maximization problem that requires techniques from differential calculus, just like maximum likelihood required the same. If it's a discrete variable, the problem is instead Instead, going to require a search through the discrete values in the range of g for its maximum. Before going any further, we'll introduce the beta and gamma distributions. These are common choices for a continuous prior distribution when the unknown parameter m ranges over intervals such as m is greater than or equal to 0 and less than or equal to 1, or m is greater than or equal to 0 but finite. 
if m happens to range over the entire real line, the normal distribution will be used as a prior. If m ranges over some other bounded interval besides 0 through 1, or some other partially bounded interval, such as m is greater than 0, then the range of m can be transformed to one of those two intervals respectively and still modeled with the gamma or beta prior distributions. Again, these implementation details for map estimation aren't going to be incredibly critical to us because we're really just using map estimation as something to motivate the technique that we're really wanting to study, which is Bayesian learning. The beta distributions are a family of probability density functions that depend on two non-negative shape parameters, alpha and beta, used to calibrate the modality of the distribution as well as the values of its mean and variance. These distributions can be used to phenomenologically model the variation of continuous random variables that are constrained to a bounded interval. As a probability density function, the beta distribution is given by a fairly complex formula, f of alpha and beta and x, that depends on different applications of the gamma function to its parameters, gamma of alpha plus beta divided by gamma of alpha times gamma of beta, times x to the alpha minus 1, times 1 minus x to the beta minus 1. Like all of the different probability distributions we've looked at in the past, we can write down formulas for the shape parameters of the beta distribution that depend upon the native parameters alpha and beta of the beta distribution. And these shape parameter formulas are given for the mean, variance, standard deviation, skewness, and kurtosis in our table. We can see that they're somewhat complex in some cases, but if we need them, we can obtain them. What's useful about these formulas is that they allow us to pick a mean and, an, and then a variance to represent the point of central tendency that we believe our prior distribution should cluster around, together with some measure of variability, and then algebraically solve for what the necessary values of alpha and beta should be in order to achieve those means and variances. We can also view a graph of several typical beta probability distributions, and that's what appears in our figure that we're looking at now. We can see that the beta distribution can take on a whole range of different kinds of shapes. Sometimes a typical bell curve or asymmetric bell curve is possible. Other times we're looking at decay from one end of its range of random variables to the other or decay then growth again from one end of its range to the other. These possibilities are all controlled by different choices of alpha and beta. In practice, if we're using the beta distribution as a prior for some unknown parameter value of some other probability distribution, then we're going to want to choose alpha and beta parameter values that lead to the more typical bell-shaped unimodal curve and we're going to want to choose those values that cause the peak or the mean of, of that curve to be close to what we believe the true parameter value is. And then we also want to choose them so that the overall width of the curve is somewhat indicative of how certain we are in that true value of the unknown parameter. And the approach for doing that is described here. So when calibrating the beta distribution as a prior for map estimation, an approach you can take is to choose alpha and beta so that the distribution mean, or mu, is approximately equal to your best subjective guess at the true value of the parameter m that you're trying to estimate. In addition, you'll need to establish a rough measure of certainty that you place upon this guess. For instance, you might choose alpha and beta so that the standard deviation is 0.1 or 0.2 in order to represent a moderately low level of certainty. This will result in a beta distribution with a reasonably large amount of spread around its point of central tendency. The equations for the mean and variance of the beta distribution may be inverted algebraically in order to facilitate this calibration, and I've given their solutions here. So alpha is equal to the, the mean that you want times the mean times 1 minus the mean over the, the standard deviation squared minus 1, 
if the standard deviation squared happens to be equal, less than the mean times 1 minus mean. And beta is equal to 1 minus the mean times the quantity, mean times 1 minus mean over the variance all minus 1. If your unknown parameter ranges over a semi-bounded interval like 0 through infinity, then you're going to need the beta distribution instead of the gamma distribution in order to model it as a prior. Like the beta distributions, gamma distributions also depend on two non-negative shape parameters, k and theta in this case. But their random variable x ranges from 0 to infinity. The probability density function that describes such random variables is given by f of k, theta, and x is equal to 1 over the gamma function applied to k times theta raised to the kth power times x raised to the k minus first power times e to the negative x over theta. Like we saw with the beta distribution, we can write down exact formulas for the shape parameters of the gamma distribution in terms of the native parameters of the gamma distribution in terms of k and theta. And those are summarized in the table here. The main purpose for having this table is that we could in principle invert these formulas so that we could write down values of k in terms of mu and sigma and values of theta in terms of mu and sigma. So given a desired mean and standard deviation representative of where we think our parameter values should be and how certain we are in that belief, we should be able to come up with formulas for or values for what k and theta need to be in order to calibrate the gamma distribution to that subjective belief. Gamma distributions tend to have a shape that takes on one of two forms. Either it's going to be a shape with its peak located at x equals 0, decaying to the right in an exponential sense, or it'll be more of a classic bell-shaped curve with a peak that's somewhere to the right of 0 and varying levels of spread or varying levels of variance. And so different traces of the gamma distribution are displayed in this figure corresponding to different selections of the parameters k and theta. So when using the gamma distribution as a prior for map estimation, an approach you can take is to choose k and theta so that the distribution mean or mu is approximately equal to your best subjective guess at the true value for your parameter m that you are trying to estimate. In addition, you'll need to establish a rough estimate of certainty you place upon this guess. And for instance, you might choose k and theta so that sigma, or the standard deviation, is comparable to the window of uncertainty around the mean that you hope to represent. This will result in a gamma distribution with a reasonably large amount of spread around its point of central tendency. The equations for mean and variance of the gamma distribution may be inverted in order to facilitate this calibration, and they are k equals mu squared over sigma squared, and theta equals sigma squared over mu. So they're quite a bit simpler than those equations that we had for the beta distribution. We now have enough in place to at least explore map estimation with a conceptual example. So it is believed that the data set D equals 13, 10, 10, and 17 is binomially distributed with a parameter value of n equals 20. However, the parameter p is unknown. In order to estimate p, we're going to construct a likelihood function, p of d given p, in the same way we would have constructed it if we were performing maximum likelihood estimation. We're going to plug n equals 20 in each data point from d into the binomial distribution formula and then form their products. b of 20 comma p comma 13 times b of 20 p and 10 times b of 20 p and 10 times b of 20 p and 17. That's our likelihood function. And at this point, we could certainly carry out maximum likelihood estimation. We could graph our likelihood function with respect to p over the range from 0 to 1 and look for its peak. And 
that's what, essentially what we've done in the figure that's displayed right now. We can see that the peak corresponds to a value of p a little bit above 0 0.6. It turns out that the true value or the maximum likelihood estimation value is 0 0.62496 for this example. Well, next we can move on to compute a map estimate for that parameter value p. We're going to calibrate the beta distribution prior for p by choosing alpha and beta in order to subjectively state that we believe p is to be about 0 0.7 with a fairly low degree of certainty. To reflect this, we've chosen a mean of mu equals 7, 0.7 and a standard deviation of sigma equals 0 0.2 for the prior beta distribution. And then using the formulas that we saw earlier, this leads to parameter values of alpha and beta equal to 2.975 and 1.275 respectively. Now, this guess that p should be about 0 0.7 is totally subjective. We could have made other guesses as well, and that subjective guess is going to be made depending on whatever knowledge, prior knowledge, we have about the system that we're modeling with the binomial distribution. We might have none where we're just making a random guess, or we might have something that causes us to choose something a little bit more specific like p equals 0 0.7 in this case. After calibrating the prior p of lowercase p, given by the beta distribution for our particular parameter choice as alpha and beta, we then form the marginal probability. And this is given in terms of an integral, integral over uh, 0 to 1 of p of d given p times the prior probability p of p. And it, it, it ends up being a fairly complex integral, but it's one that we could write down and compute numerically if we needed to. We'll also form the posterior distribution p of the parameter p given d using Bayes' formula, p of d given p times p of the parameter p divided by the marginal probability p of d. Then we're going to maximize that relative to the parameter p. This becomes our first map estimate for that parameter. Now remember, we're just taking a conceptual approach to map estimation here. We're, we're intentionally not going to get bogged down into the details of the computations we'd have to make in order to achieve this estimate. But one thing that we could imagine conceptually doing is plotting our posterior distribution with respect to lowercase p, the unknown parameter, and simply looking for where the peak of that distribution occurs. And in a minute, we'll look at a graph that, that shows that, that trace of that, that particular posterior distribution and, and finds where its maximum is. But before we do that, it's important to stop and think about what we've actually accomplished. We've taken our fairly rough, subjective, prior understanding of what the value of, of our unknown parameter p should be, and we've refined it by collecting and analyzing a set of four data points. And we refined it through this process of forming the posterior distribution and, and maximizing it. Well, something that we can do with map estimation that really isn't possible with the other approaches that we've had is that we can say that that posterior distribution that we've just formed becomes our new updated and informed understanding of how the unknown parameter should behave how well we know what the true value of that unknown parameter should be. So that becomes our new prior estimation. And then we can go out and collect some new data, d equals 12, 14, 9, and 14, and start the whole process over again. We'll form a new likelihood function, compute a new marginal probability that takes into account our new prior, and then we'll use Bayes' theorem once more to invert our likelihood function and find a new posterior distribution. And we'll maximize that a second time in order to find an even more refined map estimate. Now, again, don't forget in these calculations that the prior is no longer the beta prior. It is the posterior distribution from our first round of map estimation. The beta prior distribution both posterior distributions and the locations of the map estimates are all illustrated in the following figure.
so we can see how they relate to each other, and in particular so that we can see how this sequence of two map estimates give us, gives us successively more and more refined understandings of where the true value of our unknown parameter should lie. So here they are. The blue graph is our original beta prior distribution, and we can see that it's, it's got a fairly broad spread to it. Its mean is at 0.7, its peak is actually quite a bit higher than that. And so all of this represents a fairly uninformed understanding of where the true value of p should be. You know, we can locate a mean or a mode for that graph, but we can see that there's quite a bit of variability in it. We clear up some of that variability by computing our first map estimate in the form of the first posterior distribution we, we found by, by uh, writing down Bayes' formula. And that is the red graph. And what we can see is that it's got a peak that is much closer to the true value of p. It's down towards 0 0.6. And more importantly, that peak has steepened and narrowed. So that is the graph of our first posterior distribution. And it reflects, in a sense, that since we've gone out and calculated or, or collected some data and incorporated that into our map analysis, we now have less variability in our understanding of where that true parameter value p should lie. It's a narrower distribution. Well, we've improved the situation even better by going out and collecting yet another round of data using the first posterior distribution as our new prior and restarting map estimation in order to obtain a, a second posterior distribution. And that distribution is graphed in purple in our, our diagram. And we can see that that purple graph has had a, it's, it's got a peak that shifted a little bit, not much. It's still a little bit more than 0 0.6, but it's once again considerably steeper and narrower than even the first posterior distribution that we've got, and certainly much more precise than the, the prior distribution that we started with. So our two rounds of data collection and data analysis have led to two successive refinements on not just our understanding of where the true value of our parameter p should lie, but how much variability there is in our understanding, how much certainty we've got in, in the location of that true value. In principle, we could continue this process indefinitely, collecting more data and refining each time. And what we would expect to see is a continued, maybe gradual, but a continued steepening of these posterior distributions, meaning that we're gaining more and more certainty on the value of our unknown parameter. So it, it's my opinion that this iterative nature of map estimation that allows us to make successive refinements of our parameter estimate and our confidence in those parameter estimates has some potential. And it's, it's nice because in some ways it models this process of incrementally learning from data that we collect. It, it, it models this process of how we can learn about our world by making and analyzing observations about it. But before we get too excited about that, we should do a strength and weakness analysis of map estimation. So the strengths that are there are some of what I've just alluded to. Map can be iterated in order to gain more refined parameter estimates as new sets of data become available. And since the posterior distribution is a probability distribution, it can be used to assess the degree of certainty that you place on your estimate as well as the accuracy. So all of our other uh, parameter estimation techniques have led to what are called point estimations. And that's not really what's going on with MAP. It's, it, our estimate is the entire posterior distribution. We can obtain a point estimate from the posterior distribution by picking the mode or the median, whatever, whatever we choose. But the measure of variability, the standard deviation of that, that posterior distribution gives us a measure of, of, of um, certainty in our estimates. There are weaknesses to map, though. 
it's much more complex than our other methods. You've probably picked up on that already. And MAP also relies pretty heavily on calculus, more so than the other methods that we've, we've used. It's kind of hard to escape that. These lead to MAP being a much more computationally intense technique. And if you're going to use it, you either have to be up for implementing it carefully yourself and worrying about things like numerical stability and um, you know, programming structure and, and, and so on. Or, and this is what I recommend, you should just go out and find a package of statistical software that has Bayesian techniques built into it and use a well-developed and well-tested library for performing map estimation. They exist. You're better off using them than trying to cobble together something on your own, unless you've really got the experience for doing that. Despite the computational complexities of map estimation, I really don't think we should abandon the idea of having a way to estimate not just the value of a parameter, but the degree of certainty that we have that we're looking in the right place for that value. And Bayesian learning is a technique that we can look at that allows us to produce iteratively refined estimates of a, a known parameter of some distribution by continuously collecting and analyzing data, just like we did with map estimation. There's many variations on the process, but we're going to explore a simpler variation through an example. And just to look ahead a little bit, one way that we can think of Bayesian learning is that we're simply discretizing the process of map estimation. So we're going to be eliminating the need to do much in the way of calculus at all in order to obtain our estimates. Suppose a bird population is made up of birds that suffer from heavy metal contamination and others that don't. Our goal is to estimate the proportion P of birds that suffer from the contamination. At first, we might know nothing about the bird population at all. In this absence of information, we can propose a number of possible hypotheses that describe the value of P. Without any prior information about our bird population, we have no way of determining which of these hypotheses are correct. Therefore, the best we can do is assume that any one of these hypotheses is just as likely as being correct as any of the others. They are all equally likely to be correct. And since there's five of them, this means that the probability of H1 equals probability of H2 equals probability of H3 equals the probability of H4 equals the probability of H5 equals 0.2. We call these probabilities the prior probabilities of the five competing hypotheses. And as you can see, they are, for now, all equal. This is a pretty unsatisfying state of affairs from the point of view of wanting to know what the true value of P is. The only way we can improve this situation is to collect and analyze some data. Suppose we go out on three consecutive days, capture 20 birds with replacement from the population, and make note of how many of them showed symptoms of heavy metal contamination. The data we collect takes the following form. On day one, seven of the 20 birds we caught showed signs of contamination. On day two, 10 of the 20 birds we caught showed signs of contamination. And on day three, nine of the 20 birds we caught showed signs of contamination. We'll organize this data into a sequence of three cumulative events. D1 is the event that we've observed only data from day one. So D1 is equal to the set containing x equals seven. D2 is the event that we've observed data from days one and two. So D2 represents the set containing the values x equals seven and x equals 10. And then finally, D3 is the event that we've observed data from all three days, and D3 is equal to the set that contains the x values of seven, 10, and nine. For this data to be of any use, we have to have a way of analyzing it. Our ultimate goal is to determine which of our five hypotheses is the most likely to be correct in light of the data we've collected. 
This requires us to determine probabilities of the form p of hi given dj for i ranging from 1 to 5, representing the five hypotheses, and j rep ranging from 1 through 3, representing the three days worth of data collection. Unfortunately, these probabilities are difficult to compute directly, and they are difficult to compute all at once. Instead, we can proceed in steps. Specifically, we can compute the probability of d sub j given h sub i directly. This is, the, this is analogous to a likelihood function. In general, the interpretation of this is the probability we could collect the data we've collected, given that any one of our hypotheses is true. Once these probabilities are known, we can then use Bayes' theorem to invert them in order to find the probabilities we actually want to know, or p of hi given dj. These are analogous to posterior probabilities. It's best to see how this technique works by illustrating it as an iterative step-by-step -step process. Well, we'll begin computing p of d1, day 1, given hi for i ranging from 1 through 5. Now, we collected our data by sampling with replacement, so we can use the binomial distribution to model these probabilities. p of d1 given h1 is going to be equal to n choose x times p1 to the x times 1 minus p1 raised to the n minus x. And what p1 is, is going to be some representative value taken from the interval associated with our first hypothesis, h1, that p lies somewhere between 0 and 0.2. For our purposes, we're going to see that we're just going to take the midpoints of these intervals. So p1 will actually take on a value of 0.1. Likewise, p of d1 given h2 is equal to n choose x times the representative probability p2 raised to the x times 1 minus p2 raised to the n minus x, and so on for the other um, likelihood probabilities, uh, p of d1 given h3 through p of d1 given h5. They all follow the same pattern. Again, we do need three inputs in order to evaluate these probabilities. n is the size of our sample, p sub i is the probability of capturing a bird that's contaminated with heavy metals, given the assumption that h sub i is the correct hypothesis, and x is the number of birds we capture that show signs of contamination. We already know some of these. n equals 20 is the number of birds in our sample, and x equals 7 is the number of those who were contaminated with heavy metals. But as for p sub i, we're just going to choose, as I said, any value that belongs to the interval associated with h sub i. And for the sake of consistency within this example, we're going to just use the midpoints of each interval. Therefore, p1 is 0.1, p2 is 0.3, p3 is 0.5, p4 is 0.7, and p5 is 0.9. If we substitute those inputs into our so-called likelihood functions given by the formulas stated a couple of slides ago, we'll find that p of d1 given h1 is 1.9705 times 10 to the negative 3. p of d1 given h2 is 1.6426 times 10 to the negative 1. p of d1 given h3 equals 7.3929 times 10 to the negative 2. P of d1 given h4 is equal to 1.0178 times 10 to the negative 3. And p of d1 given h5 is equal to 3.7078 times 10 to the negative 9. Next, we'll compute the marginal probability p of d1 using the law of total probability. This is necessary if we hope to use Bayes' theorem in order to invert the prior probabilities so that we might obtain the posterior probabilities. So here it goes. p of d1 is equal to p of d1 given h1 times p of h1 plus p of d1 given h2 times p of h2 plus p of d1 given h3 times p of h3 plus p of d1 given h4 times p of h4 plus p of d1 given h5 times p of h5. Now all of those quantities are known. 
these are prior probabilities and likelihood probabilities that we've established on earlier slides. So we can just substitute the values into our formula. And if we do that, we should obtain a marginal probability of p of d1 equals 4.8236 times 10 to the negative 2. Well, with the marginal probability in place, we can finally compute the posterior probabilities using Bayes' theorem. So we're going to calculate, for instance, p of h1 given d1 through inversion. It's equal to p of d1 given h1, that's a likelihood probability, times p of h1, that's a prior probability, divided by p of d1, that's a marginal probability. If we substitute those known values into this formula, we'll get a probability of 8.1701 times 10 to the negative 3 for p of h1 given d1. Now if we follow that process analogously for p of h2 given d1, p of h3 given d1, p of h4 given d1, and p of h5 given d1, we'll obtain corresponding probabilities of 6.8108 times 10 to the negative 1, 3.0653 times 10 to the negative 1, 4.2202 times 10 to the negative 3, and 1.5373 times 10 to the negative 8. Now many of those probabilities are quite small, but p of h2 given d1 and p of h3 given d1 are moderate. 0.68 for p of h2 given d1 and 0.31 roughly for p of h3 given d1. That tells us that we are about 68% confident that the correct value for p lies somewhere in the second interval from 0.2 to 0.4, and we're about 31% confident that it lies somewhere in the third interval from 0.4 to 0.6. To reiterate, we can see that in light of the first day's data, the second hypothesis is about 68% likely to be the correct one, and the third hypothesis is about 31% likely to be the correct one. We update our values of our prior probabilities, p of h1 through p of h5, to take on these posterior probability values. In other words, p of h1 will now be 8.1701 times 10 to the negative 3, p of h2 will now be 6.8108 times 10 to the negative 1, p of h3 will now be 3.0653 times 10 to the negative 1, p of h4 will now be 4.2202 times 10 to the negative 3, and p of h5 will now be 1.5373 times 10 to the negative 8. By updating our prior probabilities to these current posterior values, what we're really doing is updating our statement of our understanding of the location of the true value of p in light of the data that we've collected and analyzed. So there's a real parallel that we're drawing between Bayesian, and lear Bayesian learning and map estimation. It's just that we're doing it in a very discrete way without the need for maximization of continuous functions that require techniques from calculus. This is the most that we can do using only the data from day one or D1. But to improve our understanding of the bird population, we can still incorporate the data we've collected through day two and analyze the influence of the event D2 upon what we know. So we essentially start the process over again. We begin by computing the new likelihood functions. And these are going to be joint likelihood functions that take into account the fact that we have two data points, two counts of contaminated birds within two different samples. So the probability of D2 given H1 is equal to B of 20 comma 0.1 comma 7. That's the probability distribution applied to our first day of data times B of 20 comma 0.1 comma 10. That's the binomial distribution applied to our second day of data. And that comes out to be a value of 1.2694 times 10 to the negative 8. If we follow that same pattern, for hypotheses 2 through 5, then we're going to see that probability of D2 given H2 is equal to 5.0621 times 10 to the negative 3. P of D2 given H3 equals 1.3026 times 10 to the negative 2. 
P of D2 given H4 equals 3.1367 times 10 to the negative 5, and P of D2 given H5 equals 2.3776 times 10 to the negative 14. These are our likelihood probabilities that incorporate the first two days worth of data collection into them. Next, we'll use these likelihood probabilities together with our new priors to calculate the new marginal probability. So it's important to note that we're no longer using our original priors that said every hypothesis was equally likely at 0 0.2 because we've updated those priors with the values from our first posterior distribution. So if we use those values correctly in our formula for the law of total probability, we'll obtain a marginal probability of P of D2 equals 7.4407 times 10 to the negative 3. Now that we have likelihoods, priors, and a marginal probability for the second day of data collection, we can use Bayes' theorem to invert the likelihoods in order to find the posterior probabilities P of H1 given D2 through P of H5 given D2. These take on the values of 1.3938 times 10 to the negative 8, 4.6335 times 10 to the negative 1, 5.3663 times 10 to the negative 1, 1 1.7791 times 10 to the negative 5, and 4.9351 times 10 to the negative 20. And the only of these probabilities that aren't tiny are P of H2 given D2 and P of H3 given D2. These represent our measure of confidence, the probability that we believe that the true value of P lies somewhere in the H2 interval, or 0.2 to 0.4, or the H3 interval, 0.4 to 0.6. And we can see that those probabilities have shifted somewhat to the right. So we're almost evenly divided on our belief that P lies in each of those two intervals. And that's because we've collected a larger number of contaminated birds in our second day of data than we did on the, on the first day. So our estimate for the probability of, of finding a contaminated bird is going up. Finally, and once again, we update our values for the prior probabilities, P of H1 through P of H5, to be the values of our new, most recent posterior probabilities. So we set P of H1 equal to 1.3938 times 10 to the negative 8, P of H2 equal to 4.6335 times 10 to the negative 1, P of H3 equal to 5.3663 times 10 to the negative 1, P of H4 equal to 1.7791 times 10 to the negative 5, and P of H5 equal to 4.9351 times 10 to the negative 20. We still have one more day of data to incorporate into our analysis, and that's going to enable us to refine our estimation of where the true value of P should lie a little bit more. So we're going to do this by essentially following the same process as we did for day two. We compute new likelihood functions, and for example, the probability of D3 given H1, the probability that we would observe all three days worth of data that we've observed given that H1 is the correct hypothesis, is equal to the product of the three binomial distributions calibrated with n equals 20 and P equal to 0.1 evaluated at the three different counts of infected, or uh, in uh, three different counts of contaminated birds in our three samples of 20. Those, were, those counts were 7, 10, and 9. If we do that, that likelihood comes out to be 6.6906 times 10 to the negative 13. If we follow that pattern for the other four hypotheses, H2 through H5, we see that P of D3 given H2 will turn out to be 3.3091 times 10 to the negative 4. P of D3 given H3 will turn out to be 2.0865 times 10 to the negative 3. P of D3 given H4 will turn out to be 3.7661 times 10 to the negative 7. And P of D3 given H5 will turn out to be 1.5543 times 10 to the negative 20. Next, we compute 
the new and final marginal probability, P of D3, using the law of total probability formula with our current likelihoods plugged in and our most recent priors, which were set equal to the values of our previous posteriors from day two. If we substitute those values into the law of total probability, we should get a marginal probability for P of D3 equal to 1.2730 times 10 to the negative 3. Finally, with our most recently updated priors and our likelihood functions from day 3 and our marginal probability from day 3, we can use Bayes' theorem in order to invert the likelihoods and arrive at the posterior probabilities. If we do that, P of H1 given D3 turns out to be 7.3255 times 10 to the negative 18. P of H2 given D3 equals 1.2044 times 10 to the negative 1. P of H3 given D3 equals 8.7956 times 10 to the negative 1. P of H4 given D3 equals 5.2. 2632 times 10 to the negative 9, and P of H5 given D3 turns out to be 6.0254 times 10 to the negative 37. At this point then, our data is telling us that we should be most confident, but with a probability of 0.8796 almost, that P falls somewhere in the third interval from 0.4 to 0.6. Since we are out of data, these are our final best estimates of the likelihood of each of our five hypotheses being the correct hypotheses. So we will update our priors one last time to take on these posterior values. To summarize, we can see that H3 is the most likely hypothesis at about 88%, and H2 comes in a somewhat distant second place at just over 12%. The interpretation of this is that we are about 88% confident that the true proportion of contaminated birds, or P, lies somewhere between 40 and 60%. If we require more confidence, we have to tack on the second interval as well. This is going to tell us that we are over 99.99999% confident that P lies between 20 and 60%. This is a pretty wide interval though, so it's probably not that useful of an estimate. It's also useful to be able to report our best estimate for a value of P, not just a range that it lies in. If we recognize that the posterior distribution is a discrete probability distribution describing the relative likelihoods of the location of the parameter P, then we can compute the expected value of P using the representative values of 0 0.1, 0 0.3, 0 0.5, 0 0.7, and 0.9 together with the probabilities given from our posterior distribution. So we just calculate that mathematical expectation and get a value of P approximately equal to 0.47591. So this is our best point estimate for the true proportion of contaminated birds in our population, and it's just under 47.6%. We're also falling back on the idea that we're about 88% confident that that is the correct estimate in the sense that we know it lies somewhere in that third interval from 0.4 to 0.6, which it does. So there's a couple of comments that are in order here. At this point, if we wanted to increase our confidence that we had the correct hypothesis, in other words, if we wanted to get a higher posterior probability that H3 is correct given the data that we've collected, we could simply go out and collect more data and continue this iterative analysis of Bayesian learning. And as long as the nature of our data didn't change, as long as the nature of our bird population didn't change over time, that should lead to a greater and greater concentration of probability in the posterior distribution onto that one interval of H3 at the expense of probabilities being concentrated onto the other intervals. In other words, we should expect that we should start seeing a probability approaching 1 for P of H3 given 
our data and zero in the others. What we can't do, what we can't accomplish by collecting more data at this point is gaining more accuracy on our estimate. We were stuck with an accuracy of a 20% wide interval when we made the decision to divide the range P from zero to one up into five equally sized intervals. Those intervals never shrink regardless of how much data that we collect. So if we wanted to have a more precise estimate for where P should lie, for which interval P should belong to, we would need to go back, start over the process, and use more than five hypotheses, use more than five intervals. We might want to divide the range from zero to one into 10 intervals or 20 or 100. Really just depends on the level of accuracy we hope to be able to shoot for. And then we would need to go out and collect enough data to get to the point where we had concentrated enough confidence through our posterior distribution onto one of those intervals. Once we got there, we would know to quit. Well, that is the conceptual view of what Bayesian learning is and how it would work in principle. You know, in practice, you would probably want to use more hypotheses, more intervals, and probably collect more data in order to achieve a greater accuracy and confidence goal. But before we quit, we should summarize the strengths and weaknesses of Bayesian learning and contrast somewhat to the map estimation technique that inspired it. So the strengths are that Bayesian learning is an iterated technique and we use it in order to gain refined parameter estimates as new sets of data become available. So that was also a strength of, of map estimation. Bayesian learning produces a discrete prior probability distribution that can be easily used to assess the degree of certainty or confidence that you place on your estimate as well as the accuracy of the estimate. So the prior distribution is its values are what give us the certainty or confidence the width of the hypotheses or the width of the intervals associated with the hypotheses are what lead to the accuracy of the estimate. Another strength is that Bayesian learning really doesn't rely on calculus at all. We never had to compute prior distributions or marginal distributions rather using, um, using calculus, using integrals, and we never had to maximize either likelihood functions or posterior distributions using techniques from calculus, using the optimization differential techniques using calculus. As far as weaknesses go, Bayesian learning is still a complex technique, but this might be a worthwhile cost. If you are interested in assessing both the accuracy and confidence level, you should assign to your estimate. This, strictly speaking, can be assessed using method of moments or maximum likelihood as well but they're not native estimates that come out of those techniques. You'd have to add on additional techniques to those methods in order to gain such estimates. And something like bootstrapping would be something you would want to look into if you were hoping to go down that road. But then that adds additional complexity to our simple techniques of method of moments and maximum likelihood estimation. So you're really not gaining that much. We've got complexity here with Bayesian learning as well. There will be a technological companion to this video in which we implement both the somewhat simplistic Bayesian learning example we just went through in MATLAB, and then we'll implement a much more realistic example where you would have a lot more data and the ability to refine your number of hypotheses into much narrower intervals in order to gain both an accurate assessment of what an unknown parameter value is with a high degree of confidence. So that'll be something that appears in an upcoming video, but we've reached the end of this video lesson. So thank you for watching. I hope you found it informative and we look forward to having you join us for the next video.